صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تآخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم I wish that I could speak to you in Malay but unfortunately I only know about four words and I think English is probably the only language that I'll be able to use. I would love to speak in Arabic as well, but I think English is understood by more. Yes. I had the honor to be in this same mosque. I had the honor to be with the Habib uh, about four years ago and uh, also to speak, but uh, it's a great joy and a great honor to be back tonight and especially to see this turnout of wonderful, beautiful people in such numbers. And may Allah bless you all and may He fill our hearts with light and may He enable us to understand this religion profoundly based on the love of Allah, based on the love of the Prophet based on the knowledge of the self, based on the knowledge of creation, and based on the knowledge of how we interact with each other. Islam is the religion of truth. Islam is the religion of the universe. Islam has in it the answer to the right to, the, to every question, and it has in it the indication of the right path. But this requires that we plant the seed of Islam and let that tree put down its roots and let it grow and bear fruit. Whenever we do that, then it provides us everything that we need in the age and the time in which we live. Allah said in the Holy Qur'an, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ في آية. So Allah said three times in the Qur'an, that it is He, it is Allah, it is God, none other. It's not fortuitous circumstance. It is He, God, the Lord of the worlds, who sent His messenger with guidance and the religion of truth in order to make it uppermost over all forms of religion, even if those who reject faith or those who associate others with God dislike it. This verse has always proven to be true throughout history. And this is something that we need to be aware of. And it is also our responsibility in this time as well. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent, Arabia was surrounded mostly by Christians, and those Christians were powerful Christians. Not only that, but they were the Christians who laid down the foundations of the Christian faith, the Byzantines, the, Mary the, the Jacobites, the Malachites, 
the different types of Christians in Egypt, in Sudan, in Ethiopia, in Palestine, in Syria, greater Syria, in Iraq, in Anatolia. The Christian world was right there. The Christian world was not in France or in England or in Germany. The Christian world was right there in greater Syria and Egypt. These were the homelands of Christianity. And the Christians held to their faith with great intensity. intensity. It was their identity. It was their nationality. The Romans had used every means available to remove Christianity. And yet, they had not succeeded in doing that. There were also Jews. There were also Zoroastrians. There were also Magians in what is today Afghanistan. And Bukhara and Central Asia, there were Buddhists. And these Buddhists were the most, they were the most effective of all Buddhists in the world da'wah of Buddhism. They are the ones who would spread Buddhism, who had spread Buddhism to China, and then to Korea and J Japan. And yet when Islam comes out of Arabia, this guidance of light, the Christians begin to enter Islam in great numbers. And so do the Jews, and so do the Magians, and so do the Zoroastrians, and so do the Buddhists, and so do the Hindus. Never in the history of religion have we ever seen anything like that. And you have to remember also that most of these peoples, they were peoples who were enemies of each other. So that you would expect that if the Copt of Egypt, who is a Jacobite, were to accept Islam, that the Nestorian wouldn't accept it. Or that if the Magian accepted Islam, that the Christian wouldn't accept it. But Islam's call was so powerful and so brilliant that all of them begin to come into Islam. And usually this process took generations. It is very well known, and all of you know that, but history establishes that, that Islam spread through toleration. It spread through teaching. It never spread by forcing people to believe. In fact, in Ahkam Ahl al-Dhimma, in the rules that pertain to the protected communities, who were Jews and Christians and Magians and others, it was forbidden to say to the Christian, Ya Kafir, O Kafir, because they're protected people and because that hurts his feelings, even though it's the truth. But we, we dealt with these people with great courtesy. We gave them incredible rights. We allowed them to develop, to develop cultures that flourished. This is very well known. And yet, Islam spread among them. Often the conversion of the majority of the populations took 200 years, 250 years, but it was a slow, strong process and one that could not be turned back. So this is again a proof of what Allah says. It is He, God, Allah, none other, who sent his messenger, bil huda wa dinin haq, with the guidance and the religion of truth, li yudhirahu ala dini kullihi, that he make it manifest over all religion in the world. So this is what happened. Islam is the religion of truth. It is the religion of the stars. It is the religion of the galaxies. It is the religion of the trees and the plants and the waters and the fishes and everything in creation. But it is the life of the human being. And one of the remarkable things about this religion in history is that wherever it went, it brought civilization. And when it came to civilizations, 
It took those civilizations and it made them into something new and to something greater than it had ever, ever been there before. I won't speak much longer because I know that you have a big program. But one of the things that I'd like to emphasize is that the human being is a religious creature. Al-Imanu Fitrah, to believe in God is our nature. And this is something that's actually been studied in universities because of the fact that in the study of anthropology, especially in the 20th century, it became clear to many anthropologists and sociologists that the human being is homo religiosus. He is the religious creature. Human beings have to have religion. And if you don't give them religion or you take it away, they will find another way. They will find a secular alternative to religion. We are religious by nature. And whenever you bring people together, we live in a world today where nothing in the world is beyond our fingertips. I'm from the United States. I live in Chicago. But if I wanted to watch this gathering on the internet, I could do that, even though I live thousands of miles away. We have access to everything in the world, and that's something which is dangerous. It is something that can be very harmful. And the internet is one of the great challenges that we face today. But at the same time, we are all together. It's easy for us to know what's happening in China and what do the Chinese believe. What's happening in Chile and Argentina and Brazil. What's happening in Europe and Central Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia. The whole world is at our fingertips. One of the interesting things about human beings, and this is a very important lesson in history, we won't talk about it in detail because we don't have time, is that when people meet like this, Chinese, Americans, Russians, Malays, Indonesians, South Americans, there is always a religious crisis. What is the nature of that crisis? In our hearts, we need to have a religious answer to the world we live in that is satisfactory. Does that make sense? In other words, living in this global world in which we live, we want to have a religious teaching, a religious conviction and practice that fits the whole world. And this is what's happening right now. In the world today, there is a new religious movement born every 12 hours. Two religious movements, two new religious movements born every day, mostly on the internet. Sometimes they don't last very long, Sometimes they live and die on the internet and they're gone. But this is very important. And what does this mean? It means that people want to have a religious conviction, a truth that works for them today, that is meaningful for them today, and also that enables them to negotiate the reality of the world, and that enables them to live with other people and to flourish with other people. This is very important. One of the great minds of the 20th century was the Englishman Arnold Toynbee. He was a great philosopher of history, a very interesting man. Toynbee understood this very well. At the end of World War II, 
Toynbee said, the great challenge of the 20th century, he wasn't thinking of the 20th, 21st century, is what religion will be able to give humankind what it needs in this new age? What religion can do that? Or neo-religion? Or new religion? One of the interesting things is that Toynbee said Islam could do that. Toynbee is saying this in the 1940s after World War II. And if you can think back in your history books, you know that this is still the colonial period. And almost all Muslims at that time are still under colonial rule. So Toynbee said Islam could do that. Islam could be that religion. You know, that speaks to all humanity. But he said, the problem is the Muslims themselves. The problem is the Muslims. Because many of them are defeated people. They're people who have been colonized. And we don't want to talk about that story at great length. But one of the effects of colonialism and post-colonialism is it cut us off from our roots. You are a gathering of people who hold on to the roots and you want to bring the roots to life. <coughs> and that's a very important thing to do. But we have got to bring this religion to life with all of its profundity, all of its depth, all of its truth, with all of the riches that it has that was embodied in the great awliya and the great ulama of our tradition. And that is the gift that we must accept ourselves. We must learn how to live that. We must learn what does this mean for us today? What does this have to say about quantum theory, about astrophysics, about biological theories? What does it have to say about psychology and social psychology? And we have a treasure of information about that. Okay, but most Muslims would not be able to say very much about it because we don't think deeply, we don't study deeply. And usually our tradition is something that most people regard as essentially irrelevant and unworthy of study, even though our tradition was a tradition of great civilization. So we ask Allah in this beautiful country, Malaysia, and in your neighboring countries, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, you know, to bring this faith to life and to bless it with great teachers like yourselves and great students like yourselves and enables us enable us to understand what this religion means to us today. And then, inshallah, maybe we can begin to fulfill the task of huwa alladhi arsala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al haqqi li yudhhirahu ala deen kullihi that he, God, is the one who sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth to make it clear, to make it, to render it uppermost over all religion. I come from the West. I was born a Christian. I became a Muslim 45 years ago by the grace of Allah. And I know my people, and I know how they think, and maybe even some of the big mistakes they make in the way they think. And Islam has the answer to, answers to all of that. We have got to be able to give that answer. May Allah enable us, you know, to use everything we have, especially dua, so that he protect the way of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and that he protect us from all the innovations 
Al-Habib Ahmed Mashur, may Allah be pleased with him, who was one of my teachers, one of my most beloved teachers. He used to say about a certain group of pe people, قَوْلُهُمْ bid'a, bid'a. The way they say bid'a, innovation, 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 it's an innovation because they are an innovation. And these groups, which are actually innovators, even though they say they have the truth and others don't, they cut Islam off at the root. And therefore, is it surprising that they never produce smiling faces? They never make people happy? They don't bring peace? When Islam came to Malaya, and Islam came to Indonesia, and to the Philippines, and Thailand, and Cambodia, and these other places, it came with a smiling face. The Habaib did not come with a frown on their face. And they didn't come telling people, be our slaves and do what we say. They came with a message that will liberate you, that will make you strong, that will make you flourish. And we could talk about that at great length. It's very important for us to live this religion and to live up to this religion and to protect this religion today, bi-ithnillahi ta'ala, from all of the satanic calls that are on the right and on the left, and that are saying, this is Islam, and look how ugly it is. This is Islam, and look how destructive it is. No, Islam is not like that. The Islam of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ahli baytihi, wa sahabatihi al-kiram, this is an Islam that liberates, this is a land, Islam that gives us humanity. This is an Islam that gives us civilization, and all human beings need that today. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give it to us all and to enable us to live it. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.